not being a family son.
It is great to see all of you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, welcome. We are glad that you are here. We would ask that you please fill out one of the attendance cards in the pew in front of you. We would love to have a record of your visit today. We hope that everything that we say and do will be in accordance with our Lord and Savior this morning. Also, for all of you that have logged online, thank you for uh, logging in. Our brother Nick will be bringing a lesson of the hour. Our youth minister as brother walks out of town. And so we will be singing a lot of what his lesson is going to be going with. I hope. The first song is not in your, I mean, this next song is not in your book. It's up on the screen, okay? Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation so Well 
Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for our lives. We thank you for our health. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to worship you, to open your word, to study it, to apply it to our lives, to affect other people. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for those who meet here. We're thankful for the love we have for you, the unity we have within this congregation. We ask to have the Heavenly Father that it ever be so. We're mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of many that are not with us. Those that are either traveling, we ask if they're traveling, that you give them safe passage to and from their destination. We also know, dear Heavenly Father, that there are many within this congregation that are not doing well physically. <coughs> we ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you be with them. We ask that you keep them within the hall of your hand. <coughs> Watch over them. Be with those that minister to them that they might have a portion of their health and might be able to be back with us once again. We're thankful for those that labor here in this congregation, in this community. We are thankful for elders and deacons and preachers. Ask your Heavenly Father that you continue to be with them and give them wisdom to do the right things and make the right decisions within this body to be able to affect this community and continue to spread your word. We ask our Heavenly Father that as we continue to worship this morning, that we do so in a manner that is well pleasing to you. And as we take the uh, emblems, the communion, that we reflect back on the great sacrifice that Jesus gave his life on Calvary's cross, doing your will, because you loved us so much. We ask our Heavenly Father that you go with us this hour. Continue to forgive us of the sins that we commit. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to always let your word shine through us to those that we work with, we come in contact with, and we might be able to, to share your good news. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Number 359, please, 359. We'll sing this song and prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. 359, please. Save us. 
put it down here again. Our Father in heaven, we thank you also for the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Jesus that is shed on that cross. Help us to remember that time and that blood. Help us look forward to his return. Please help us as we take this fruit of the vine and that we do so in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, and we now have an opportunity to give. We have an online giving with the QR code, and we also have uh, trays in the box in the back, which you can give uh, on your way out. Please bow with me now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings that you give to us each day. We thank you for this opportunity to return a portion of those blessings to you. We pray that we would do so cheerfully and generously. And Pray that you would guide those that have the oversight of this money, that they would use it to help those in need, to spread the gospel throughout this area and throughout the world. Bless us as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you are following along with Psalm books, the invitation song will be number 947, 947. You'll put your marker there. That'll be our song of encouragement at the proper time. 947. Before our scripture reading, our lesson of the hour, again, I said to our youth minister, Brother Nick, will be bringing us a message of the hour. And uh, if we do have a class available for any kids ages 2 through 5, and you are interested in a class for your child while uh, the lesson is being presented here in the auditorium. While we sing this song, it make your way up through the back, down the hallway, last classroom on your right, there'll be someone there to assist you. Also, at the end of the hallway, we do have a Spanish-speaking service. We'll be singing together in Spanish and bringing the message in Spanish, and you're more than welcome to take a part of that if you'd like to. Uh, we're going to sing the song. It's not in your book. It'll be on the screen. Everybody, please stand so you can see it, and we will sing out. <laughs> It won't be very long till this sort of life shall end. It won't be very long till Jesus shall descend. And then the dead in Christ from man's own clay shall rise to meet the Lord and King up yonder in the skies. It won't be very long, it won't be very long till Jesus shall appear. Be very long till here we cease to roam. 
It won't be very long till all the saints get home, and then with smiling face we'll walk the streets of gold and sing the Savior's praise. For saints are never old. It won't be very long. It won't be very long till Jesus shall appear. Daniel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. <coughs> For this reason the king was angry and very furious, and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Have you ever had to break bad news to someone who was like a difficult person or a wrathful person or you know maybe had a short fuse uh, when I was in kindergarten I uh, so this is like five years old um, I was at the YMCA daycare camp thing uh, after school daycare and there was a <clears throat> there was a teacher there named Mr. Drew who he was the meanest teacher he was the mean one that they always had and he was the worst he was so mean he was such a jerk Mr. Drew, meanest guy ever. No one really liked him. And so, well, one day, he asked me, he said, hey, Nick, I left my Coke, my bottle of Coke in the other room. Would you go grab it for me? So, of course, I did. I wasn't going to tell him no. And I went to go get it. And when I got it, while I'm walking back with this Coke in my hand, one of the older students, one of the fifth graders says, whoa, where'd you get soda? And I said, oh, it's not mine. It's Mr. Drew's. And he goes, oh, it's Mr. Drew's? Can I see that? I said, yeah. And he shakes it up vigorously and says, here you go, hands it back to me. And I'm like, I'm five at this point. And so I go up to Mr. Drew and I go to hand it to him. And like I said, I'm in kindergarten. I'm terrified of the mean teacher. And I know that if I tell him his soda has been shaken up and probably ruined, he's not going to be very happy. And I also know better than to cross the fifth grader, the oldest student there, and snitch and rat him out. I know better than this. So I am in a, I'm in a lose-lose situation here. And again, I'm five. I don't have the rational thinking capabilities, the reasoning capabilities. I'm just scared out of my mind. And so what I decide to do is to hand Mr. Drew his coat without saying anything <laughs> and hope for the best. And what did you know? And he cracks it open and it spills all, all over him. And he just looks at me and then I just started crying. <laughs> Difficult person. And I opted for the, uh, the just don't, the chicken out response. So I don't know if you have a similar story where you either chickened out and breaking bad news to a difficult person or maybe you swallowed the pill and did it. I don't know what your story is. But we do have one in scripture that's sort of similar to this where Daniel himself was put in a situation where he had to break some bad news to an even more difficult person than Mr. Drew. Our current series, let's go back to slide, uh, Jordan. Our current series is Daniel Under Occupation, where we're looking through the book of Daniel, not necessarily just the person Daniel, but the entire book of Daniel, and that's important because there's a couple stories without him in them. <clears throat> the story of Daniel is set just after Babylon has attacked the nation of Judah. 
And not only have they attacked them, they have wiped Judah out <clears throat> and deported all of the Judeans, all of the people of God, into the borders of the Babylonian Empire. Among those imported were Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, who later become known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so this will be our third lesson from this book thus far. We looked at the story of King Zedekiah and how his terrible and selfish leadership directly led to the Israelites getting sent into Babylonian captivity. How King Zedekiah's refusal to listen to reason and refusal to listen to the prophet Jeremiah and by effect, the very voice of the Lord. King Zedekiah's refusal to listen to those things directly led to Judea being taken into exile. Judah, I should say. <laughs> Michael also walked us through chapter 1, where Daniel and his friends were pressured by King Nebuchadnezzar to, and the king's men to eat the fine foods and enjoy the extravagant trappings that come along with being in the king's palace. And this is a very important chapter in the book of Daniel because it serves as an overview for the entire book in and of itself. And it serves as an overview of what the series will look like. <clears throat> Daniel and his friends are constantly being put in situations where they are expected to do what the Babylonians want. And oftentimes, in the process of doing that, they must forfeit their Jewish identity and their religious conviction. And instead, Daniel and his friends refuse to be assimilated in ways that put them in danger. And still they find thoughtful, peaceful ways to resolve conflict where they can continue to exist without apostatizing. So, without further ado, let's take a look, let's take a look at chapter 2 of Daniel, starting in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So, king, king Nebuchadnezzar has been having bad dreams. So what he does is he commissions the wise men to counsel him concerning his dreams. And Daniel and his friends would have been included in that list of wise men. <clears throat> Verse 4, jump ahead a bit. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king! Live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, you show me the dream and its interpretation. <clears throat> um, King Nebuchadnezzar expects them not only to interpret his dream, but to tell them to tell him what he dreamed as well. And obviously, none of the wise men in the kingdom can read King Nebuchadnezzar's mind. In fact, it even says in verse ten. <clears throat> The Chaldeans answered, and the king said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The, the thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. And so the wise men know, look, what you're asking is not possible. Only God could reveal your thoughts to you, king. <clears throat> Reading on, verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill him. So, in case it wasn't already clear enough, King Nebuchadnezzar is an extremely difficult person in fact, he's also, not only is he difficult, he's wrathful and has absolute power. It's one thing when the person is difficult. It's an entirely another thing when the difficult person has the power over your life. <clears throat> I'm going to kill everyone who can't read my mind 
is an all-time statement from a difficult person. And this is exactly, essentially, what Nebuchadnezzar tells the wise men and Daniel and his friends. <clears throat> and so Daniel and his friends are now caught in the crossfire of this wrathful, difficult man who, like we said, happens to hold all the power. And can't you just see Daniel and his friends minding their own business in their chambers, doing whatever, eating vegetables, like Michael said, <laughs> and then they just hear word, oh, hey, guys, just to let you know, King Nebuchadnezzar's not in a good mood today, and he's basically said he's going to kill all of you if you can't interpret his dream. So just, just so you know. <laughs> Let's read their reaction. Oh, was that it right there? Was it verse 12 and 13? Yes, that was right. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went into Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. So Daniel, rather than just simply getting killed, tells the king's servant that he will be the one to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 26. Oops. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no wise man, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So Daniel has the boldness, and quite frankly the gall, to tell King Nebuchadnezzar to his face that his personal God has the power that none of the other wise men and none of the other magicians and none of the other gods, quite frankly, have been able to demonstrate. Reading on. <clears throat> you saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all together were broken into pieces, and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So Daniel reveals the dream that we have all surely seen before. A great statue with a golden head, a silver chest, bronze thighs, and iron legs. Then a stone from the gods comes and destroys it. And it doesn't just knock the statue down. The stone crumbles the statue to a point where it was just ash that had completely faded away, never to be remembered again. Reading on, this is the statue, in case you haven't seen this image before. <clears throat> Reading on, verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Is the next line? No, okay, you're right. Daniel tells, and it's worth noting here, King Nebuchadnezzar, essentially conceding that God in heaven has given you supreme power on earth, power over the beasts of the field, the humans of the earth, basically... That the Babylonian power has come directly from God. And it is worth noting that God has seemingly given this power to a wrathful and violent man in the form of King Nebuchadnezzar. And his kingdom is represented by the golden head of the statue. Verse 39, another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. 
And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And so the rest of the precious metals, as you well know, and I'm sure everyone has heard this a thousand times, the precious metals of the statue represent a line of kingdoms that will come after Babylon. Verse 44, finally, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces in all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. God And God's kingdom will end all of these man-made kingdoms and reign forever. Now, I don't know about you, but I would think, based on the way King Nebuchadnezzar has been described to us so far, I would think that he would not take this information too kindly. That the king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar, reigned forever. That that king and his kingdom <clears throat> will eventually be seceded by lesser kingdoms and ultimately, be, and ultimately be destroyed completely and wiped from the face of the earth. I would think King Nebuchadnezzar would not have taken too kindly to that information. But let's see how he responds. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. <clears throat> Is there another verse? No, you're right. Yes. I'm sorry. I haven't memorized my PowerPoint today. I don't know if you've picked up on that. <laughs> Thankfully, for whatever reasons, reasons that don't make any sense to me, King Nebuchadnezzar receives the information about the future and the fate of himself and of his kingdom. He receives this information justly and praises God for revealing the truth to him. And we'll see next week at Michael's lesson whether or not Nebuchadnezzar really understands the truth. But the truth is this, that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms that will fill God's world with violence and destruction. And however, one day, God's kingdom will come and confront these empires and fill the world instead with God's healing justice. The question today is this, the question is whether or not the world is still inhabited by human kingdoms that fill the world with violence and injustice. And if the answer to that question is yes, how can we as God's people usher in his kingdom and replace sin and wrongdoing and oppression and violence with justice and peace and healing? <clears throat> and this is where most Christians struggle. Because I think all of us in this room would agree univocally that we want God's will to triumph over violence and wrath and abuse of power. The problem is that we have foolishly convinced ourselves that the only way to do this is to bring our own violence and our own wrath and our own power down upon God's enemies. <clears throat> we have convinced ourselves that the only answer to violence is greater violence that the only answer to hate is more hate, that the answer to the world isolating from God is to simply isolate God from the world. And Daniel doesn't do it this way. In fact, the Bible doesn't call us to do it that way. Daniel somehow found a way to communicate the just truth to King Nebuchadnezzar in a way that he would receive it. And Daniel trusted in God to guide the king's heart towards mercy. Daniel didn't start a violent revolution against the king that would have easily been squashed by the Babylonian ranks. Daniel didn't belittle the king's intelligence or call him a wicked sinner. Rather, Daniel simply revealed the truth of what the kingdom of God is and what it looks like. Daniel revealed this truth to the one who was ignorant of it. And that was enough. At least for now, that was enough. And we should do likewise. We should look to reveal the kingdom of God to those who have not seen or experienced it. Rather than looking to call out those who haven't seen or experienced it, rather calling those people wicked or evil, 
We should trust in God to redeem even our enemies by showing the way of the kingdom of heaven. And in case you're wondering, the kingdom of heaven is enough. <clears throat> if you can reveal what the kingdom of God looks like to your enemies, they will listen. If you can show a world where the sheep will lie down with the wolf, where swords are beaten into plowshares, where the entirety of the population of the world exists in peace and freedom in the garden of the Lord. If you can show a world where the mountain of God is the tallest of all the mountains, people will listen. Our enemies will listen. And they will come and make pilgrimage up that mountain. Do you believe this? Do you believe that the truth of the gospel that the fully revealed kingdom of God is enough to change the hearts of our enemies. <clears throat> I hope so. Because as Tommy just sang, it will not be very long until the kingdom of heaven is fully at hand. Until God makes everything new. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even you and me. And if you need to be made new right now, I encourage you to do it now as we stand and sing. <laughs> Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love with the surgery, so please keep Blake and that family in your prayers. Also, we have backpacks available from our back to school bash. So if you have school aged children and you would like to uh, get some backpacks for them, please see Amy about that. Uh, also, please keep Virginia O'Sullivan in your prayers. Uh, this past week, her sister passed, so please pray for her. And just want to invite you back tonight. Uh, one of our young men from the last leaders will be doing the devotional. So uh, we would like as many people here as possible to the heaven. <coughs> That's all the updates I have. 
Join me for a closing prayer. For this time to praise and worship you, for being able to strengthen our faith. Father, as we go through this coming week, we pray that with our whole hot heart we would seek you. We ask that you would show each of us your will for our lives. We pray that you would strengthen us spiritually to serve in your kingdom. Father, please help us to be more like your son. That in all we do, through our words, our thoughts, and our deeds, we would glorify you. Father, we pray that we would be an example to those around us and those we need, and that we'd always be zealous to share the gospel. Lord, we we thank you for Jesus, that he's willing to give his life, that we have the hope of heaven. We humbly ask that you would forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
say, if we can figure out a way around that, you know, so there might be some people that pay a lot of money for that, but you know, they, I, don't, I don't think we want to avoid that. We've got Cummins there, we've got 